No land was more coveted by the king in Prussia than Silesia. By gaining his Austrian claim land in the 1740s, Frederick vastly increased the territory of his kingdom. But his old adversary, Maria Theresa, was far from sitting still. The Habsburgs made plans to recapture Silesia. Fearful of a mass invasion, Frederick made a preemptive strike through Saxony, opened the Silesian feeder of the Seven Years' War. In 1757, Frederick launched a fierce invasion of Bohemia aimed toward Prague, hoping to end the war before the Habsburg allies could mobilize. But on June 18th, Prussian fortune changed. Near the town of Colleen, the Prussian army was devastated by a day-long push toward the Austrians situated on rolling hills. The Prussians fell back home, defeated. Sensing a defeat, the Austrian alliance pushed in upon Prussia from all sides. From the east came Russia, from the west came France, from the north came Sweden, and from the south came the Austrian forces for Lusada. While the Austrian army was competent in troops, it had a less than ideal commander. Charles Alexander of Lorraine only held his position due to being the brother of Francis I, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Maria's husband. Charles was lethargic to move his forces, which infuriated many of his experienced officers. At the urging of the Empress, Charles gradually began to move into Silesia and centered upon a small Prussian force defending Breslau. This allowed Frederick to pull every soldier he could gather and stop the French and Holy Roman advance at Rossbach on November 5th. He then rushed his army across country to defeat Charles, but before he could arrive in Silesia, the small Prussian contingent fell along with the city of Breslau. For the first time in over a decade, Austria once more had possession of a part of Silesia, but Frederick was determined to make this short-lived. At dawn on December 5th, the Prussian advance guard drove a small contingent of Austrians from the village of Borna. Frederick would ride ahead to scout out the enemy positions. Stand on the little hill of Schornberg, Frederick observed the situation on the snow-dusted frozen fields. The Austrian army had formed in a wide line of five miles north to south, their center fixed upon Luton. Charles knew he outnumbered the Prussians two to one, and as such, a large line would make it difficult for the Prussians to execute their flanking maneuvers. Artillery was placed in the center in the flanks with a reserve unit to call upon. Charles hoped for any Prussian attack to come headlong across open fields, but what Charles didn't know was these were the training grounds of the Prussians where Frederick had refined his techniques. The seemingly flat land was in fact made up of multiple swells, just high enough to conceal anyone moving on the horizon. At around 9 a.m., Frederick began to send his entire army on a march to the south, being concealed by the small hills. If the Austrians were grown suspicious, their attention was soon diverted to their right flank. The fog evaporated to reveal a group of hussars moving on the road from Borna. General Cavalry Lucchese requested reinforcements to the flank, which Charles granted with Antenberg. But when his second in command, Leopold Joseph von Don, went to inspect the troop movements, Charles also moved more cavalry to strengthen the right. By the time these reinforcements arrived to the wooded Zettel Bush, however, the Prussians began to retreat. Charles felt a sense of security. His strength in numbers had scared off Frederick. At noon, however, Frederick was in the process of finalizing his lines into battle south of Luton. The Prussians were arrayed in two lines, with a third line consisting of grenadiers in the middle, the flanks guarded by cavalry commanded by Dresden and Zeiten. At 1 p.m., the order to advance was given. From the trees emerged the bulk of the Prussian force. Each unit moved right to left in spaces of 15 minutes. Their first obstacle was the knoll of Kaifenberg outside of Schagowitz, guarded by battalions of Protestant sympathizers and Baravians. Never before had these soldiers been under Prussian fire, and they quickly broke and fled from the field. The battalions commanded by Nadesty herded to the left flank, who stopped the leading unit commanded by Karl Henrik von Wendell, who had advanced far too quickly. Nadesty launched several groups of soldiers commanded by Nostris to try and outflank the Prussian assault call, but they became stopped by Zeitin in a frozen bog. Both sides took heavy casualties, but after 14 wounds, Nostris himself fell into enemy hands, his troops fleeing. Charles soon began realizing what was occurring, the expected flank attack having taken place opposite of where he planned. As Nadesi fell back to Luton, Charles and Von Don rounded up as many Austrian regiments they could to form a new line of battle north of the village. Some, like General Cavalry Cerebolni, fled the field when seeing the Prussians rushing toward town, but others took position in buildings and attended to turn Luton into a choke point. 
The first Prussian advance upon Luton at 3.30 was blunted by the Austrians who had taken position within the town's Catholic church. The Prussians made several attempts to enter the village, which were repulsed with viciously similar results. The streets were packed in some places a hundred deep in rank. Case shot cut through the walls of houses and tore apart men from both sides, only increased in the chaos. Eventually, a cannonball tore a hole within the wall of the church's courtyard, allowing grenadiers to capture the troublesome structure. Within an hour, the Prussians had savagely pushed the Austrians to the shallow heights north of Luton. But Lucchese still felt there was a chance to salvage the day, noticing seemingly unguarded Prussian artillery positions on top of Butterberg and Juneberg. He began to lead his cavalry in a charge south. However, from behind Schornberg emerged Dresden's cavalry. The two sides locked sabers. The terrific Austrian charge turned into an intense struggle for the fate of the battle. In the chaos, Lucchese was killed, and with them went the hopes of Austrian victory. A few brave Austrians tried to rally around the windmills north of Luton, withstanding vicious artillery fire from the Prussians. Their actions, however, were in vain, as the rest of Charles' army was in flight back to Breslau, with Frederick hot on his heels. The running battle went on till nine in the dark, with increasing snow forcing Frederick to call an end to the day. At the end of December 5th, the Prussians would have lost over a thousand dead, with 5,000 more wounded or captured. But their butcher's bill paled in comparison to the ghastly losses for the Austrians, with a reported 3,000 dead, 7,000 wounded, and over 12,000 captured. A particular note were some 51 battle flags that fell into Prussian hands. The cataclysmic defeat wiped the Habsburg victories of that year, and left Charles and Von Don in the depths of despondency. Frederick would capitalize on Luton by besieging Breslau, removing the Austrians from Silesia once and for all. Luton changed the complexity of the Seven Years' War. No longer would Frederick of Prussia be said in insulting tongues. Austria and its allies would try to avoid fighting Prussia in open ground throughout the remainder of the conflict. And Maria Theresa would have no choice but to have Charles resign from the Silesian front. Von Don would take his place and be a foreign Frederick's side throughout the remainder of the war. By the following year, Von Don would exact some revenge for Luton, surprising Frederick's army at Hotchkicks. The Battle of Rossbach and Luton would be the heights of Frederick's achievements in the Seven Years' War. In the years that followed, the King of Prussia would be fighting a multi-front conflict that seemed improbable to win, but just like the situation in 1757, fortunes would be turned as cohesion broke down among the Habsburg's allies. Prussia and Austria would return to pre-war borders, with Luton playing a significant role in this decision. Later in life, Frederick would declare Luton his greatest achievement. A tower and victory column was erected on the behest of Prussian King Frederick Wilhelm IV in 1845 to commemorate the achievements of his second great uncle's army, which became a casualty of another world war that scarred the landscape a century later, and has since left Luton to gradually fade from memory. <laughs>